And now we begin Jennifer Donnelly's award-winning debut novel, which tells how, in the summer of 1906, the body of a drowned woman was found in Big Moose Lake. As the story behind Grace Brown's death unfolds, 17-year-old Matty Gokey must choose between her desire to be a writer and the excitement of a first romance. But Matty is somehow involved via a parcel of letters she'd been asked to burn. Vicky Simon reads the first instalment of A Gathering Light. When summer comes to the North Woods, time slows down. And some days it stops altogether. The sky, grey and lowering for much of the year, becomes an ocean of blue, so vast and brilliant you can't help but stop what you're doing, pinning wet sheets to the line, maybe, to stare up at it. Locusts whir in the birches, and the heat stills the air, heavy and sweet, with the scent of balsam. As I stand here on the porch of the Glenmore, the finest hotel in all of Big Moose Lake, I tell myself that today, Thursday, July 12, 1906, is such a day. Time has stopped, and the beauty and calm of this perfect afternoon will never end. The guests up from New York, all in their summer whites, will play croquet on the lawn forever. The children of doctors and lawyers from Utica, Rome, and Syracuse will always run through the woods, laughing and shrieking, giddy from too much ice cream. I believe these things with all my heart, for I am good at telling myself lies. Until Ada Bouchard comes out of the doorway and slips her hand into mine. They've been dragging the lake, ain't they? Ada whispers. I squeeze her hand. I don't think so. Cook says they probably got lost that couple, that's all. I'm scared, Maddie, ain't you? I'm not scared, not exactly, but I can't explain how I feel. Words fail me sometimes. I have read most every one in the Webster's International Dictionary of the English Language, but I still have trouble making them come when I want them to. Right now I want a word that describes the feeling you get, a cold, sick feeling deep down inside, when you know something is happening that will change you, and you don't want it to, but you can't stop it. And you know that you will never again be quite the same person you were. Maddie, open the parlor! Cook shouts, heedless of the guests. Quick, girl! Mr. Crab is coming up the path, carrying a young woman in his arms. Her head lolls against him like a broken flower. Water drips from her skirt. Aw, oh, jeez, Maddie, look at her. Shh, Ada, uh, she's got soaked, that's all. They got lost on the lake, and and the boat tipped, and they swam to shore, and sh she must have fainted. Maddie, Cook shouts again. Open the spare room, the one off the parlor. Pull the shades and lay an old blanket on the bed. Ada, go fix a pot of coffee and some sandwiches. Well, shift yourselves. I'm in the room snapping the blanket open over the bear ticking just as Mr. Crab comes in. He lays her down on the bed. I'll fetch a hot water bottle, I say, looking at Cook, and some tea and... Hush, Maddie. It's too late for that, Cook says. I make myself look at her then. Her eyes are dull and empty. Her skin has gone the yellow of muscatel wine. There is an ugly gash on her forehead, and her lips are bruised. Behind me, Cook badgers Mr. Crab. What about the man she was with, Carl Graham? No sign of him, he says. We're going out again in case Graham made it to shore and got lost in the woods. Too confident, that fella. Only a darn fool from the city could tip a skiff on a calm day. He says more but I don't hear him. It feels like there are iron bands around my chest. Behind my eyes, I see a packet of letters tied with a pale blue ribbon. Letters that are upstairs under my mattress. Letters that I promise to burn. 
I can see the address on the top one. Chester Gillette, 17 and a half Main Street, Cortland, New York. His name's not Carl Graham. It's Chester, Chester Gillette. The words burst out of me before I can stop them. How do you know that, Maddie? Cook asks. I, uh, I heard her call him that, I guess. I stammer, suddenly afraid. Did you see something, Maddie? Do you know something you should tell us? What had I seen? Too much. What did I know? Only that knowledge carries a damned high price. Miss Wilcox, my teacher, had taught me so much. Why had she never taught me that? Fractious. It was a spring morning, end of March. Not quite four months ago, though it seems much longer. We were late for school and there were still chores to do before we left, but Beth, my youngest sister who's five, didn't care. She just sat there ignoring the cornmeal mush I'd made her, bellowing like some opera singer up from Utica to perform at one of the hotels. She was singing to fill all the empty spaces in our house, to chase away the silence. Most mornings I didn't mind her noise, but that morning I had to talk to Pa about something, something very important, and I was all nerves. The kitchen door banged open and Lou, all of eleven, passed behind the table with a bucket of milk. She'd forgotten to take off her boots and was tracking manure across the floor. Lou, your boots! Mind your boots! What? I can hardly hear you, Matt. Cripe's sake, shut up, will you? She clapped a hand over Beth's mouth. Beth squealed and wriggled and the chair went over and hit Lou's bucket. The milk and Beth went all over the floor. Then Beth was bawling and Lou was shouting and I was wishing for my mother as I do every day, a hundred times at least. When Mama was alive, she could make breakfast for seven people, hear our lessons, patch Pa's trousers, pack our dinner pails, start the milk to clabberin', and roll out a pie crust, all at the same time and without ever raising her voice. I'm lucky if I can keep the mush from burning and Lou and Beth from slaughtering each other. Abby, 14, bossed Lou and Beth into their coats. Ain't you coming, Matt? Beth asked. In a few minutes. I finally heard Pa come into the shed, and then he was in the kitchen. That devil of a sow ate four of her piglets, he said. He sat down, looking thunderous, no doubt toting up the money he'd lost on the dead piglets. Cost your mother a whole dollar secondhand, that book, he said nodding at the dictionary still open on the table. Put it up before it's covered in grease. I put it back in the parlor, then poured Pa a cup of hot tea, black and sweet, just the way he liked it. I sat down across from him and looked around the room, at the red and white check curtains that needed washing, at the faded pictures cut off calendars from Becker's farm and feed supply that Mama had tacked on the walls, at the cracked linoleum, the black stove. I just about worked up the nerve to open my mouth when Pa spoke first. I'm sugaring tomorrow. Maple sap's flowing like a river. You're to stay home and help me boil. Pa, I can't. I'll fall behind if I miss a day, and my examinations are coming up. Cows can't eat learning, Maddie. You're lucky you're going at all this year. And it's only because the notion of you getting your diploma meant something to your mother. Oh, you won't be going next year. I can't run this place by myself. I was angry with my father, but he was right. He couldn't run a 60-acre farm alone. I wished then that it was still winter and snowing night and day, and there was no plowing or planting, just long evenings of reading and writing stories and poems in my composition book, and Pa with nothing to say about it. Fractious, my word of the day. Cross, irritable, peevish. Fits my father to a T. Pa, I want to ask you something. 
Can I work at one of the camps this season? Maybe the Glenmore? Abby's old enough to get the meals and look after everyone. I asked her and she said she'd be fine and I thought that if I... No. But Pa... You don't have to go looking for work. There's plenty right here. Pa, they pay well. No, Maddie, and that's the end of it. There are all sorts at those tourist hotels. All sorts meant men. It wasn't the idea of strange men that bothered Pa. That was just an excuse. It was the idea of somebody else leaving him. If Pa said no to the Glenmore, which was only a few miles up the road, what on earth would he say to New York City? Miss Nomer Nothing on our entire farm was as unyielding, as immovable, as adamant and uncompromising as Pleasant the Mule. It was remarkably warm for the start of April. I was tired and dirty. My hands were raw from guiding the plow, and Pa had kept me home from school again. I was waiting on a letter that was going to come care of Miss Wilcox, if it came at all, and it was all I could think about. I was just winding up to throw a pebble at Pleasant's behind when I heard a voice behind me say, Peg your mule with that and you'll scare him. He's like to take himself, that plowing you, across the field and through the fence. I turned around and saw Royal standing at the edge of the field, watching me. Broad-shouldered and handsome. Handsomest one of all the Loomis boys. Hey, Royal, I said, trying to keep my eyes from roosting on any one part of him for too long. Let me have him, he said, taking the reins. Giddy up, you. He snapped the reins smartly against Pleasant's rump, much harder than I had. Pleasant budged. Boy, did he. I watched Royal as he plowed a row, turned at the end of the field and came back. Thanks, I said. I'll take him now. That's all right, I'll finish it. You follow behind and pull stones. I did as he said. Why you call your mule pleasant? He's anything but. It's a misnomer, I said, pleased to be able to use my word of the day. You call your mule Miss? Miss Pleasant? It's a boy mule. No, not Miss Pleasant. Misnomer. It means a misapplied name. Like when you call a fat person slim. It's my word of the day. I pick a word out of the dictionary every morning and memorize it and try to use it. It helps build vocabulary. I'm reading Jane Eyre right now, and I hardly ever have to look up a word. Royal gave me a look over his shoulder. A wincing, withering look that made me feel like the biggest babbling blabberer in all of Herkimer County. I kept my eyes on the furrows for a while, but that got to be boring, so I stared at Royal's backside. I had never really noticed a man's backside before. I thought Royal's was very nice. Round and proud like two loaves of soda bread. He turned around just then and I blushed. I wondered what Jane Eyre would have done, then realized that Jane was English and proper and wouldn't have gone around eyeing Rochester's backside to begin with. Two hours later, we sat down for a rest. I gave him a piece of the Johnny cake I brought. This is good, he said. I was about to tell him Abby made it, but then his honey-colored eyes were on me, and I didn't. And tomorrow, Vicki Simon reads the second installment of A Gathering Light by Jennifer Donnelly. It was abridged in five parts by Penny Lester. The producer was Elizabeth Allard. Time now for part six of The Shadow Over Innsmouth by Julian Simpson. Kennedy is making progress with a little help from Alice. Haywood has found Melody Cartwright, but others are still missing. Still no sign of Jasper. He's now been missing for about 16 hours, and uh, given what I witnessed last night beneath that cafe... Actual running water. <laughs>
and the excitement of a first romance. Today, Matty reads some of Grace's letters, wins a scholarship to college and goes for a high-speed carriage ride with Royal. South Otselic, June 19th, 1906. My dear Chester, I have often heard the saying, it never rains but it pours, but I never knew what it meant until today. Maddie, what in blazes are you doing? It's Cook. She startles me so I nearly jump out of my shoes. Uh, nothing, ma'am, I stammer, slamming the door to the cellar shut. That ice cream done? Um, very nearly, ma'am. I walk back to the ice cream churn and feel Grace Brown's letters hanging heavy in my skirt pocket. Why did Cook have to come back into the kitchen just then? Two more seconds and I would have been down the cellar stairs and in front of the huge coal furnace. The letters would have caught immediately. I could have been done with them. Chester, I have done nothing but cry since I got here. If you were only here, I would not feel so badly. I can't help thinking you will never come for me. Ever since Grace Brown handed the letters to me, I have sorely wanted to be done with them. She gave them to me yesterday afternoon on the porch, after I'd brought her a lemonade. I'd felt sorry for her. I could tell she'd been crying. I knew why, too. She'd had a fight with her beau at dinner. It was over a chapel. She'd wanted to go and find a chapel, but he wanted to go boating. She'd refused the drink at first, saying she couldn't pay for it, but I said she didn't have to, figuring what Mrs. Morrison, the manager's wife, didn't know wouldn't hurt her. And then, just as I was turning to go back inside, she asked me to wait. She opened her gentleman friend's suitcase and pulled a bundle of letters from it. She took a few more from her purse, undid the ribbon around them, tied all the letters together, and asked me to burn them. Promise me you will, she said. Please. The door from the dining room swings open. It's Ada. Man from the Boonville Papers here. Mrs. Morrison says I should bring him coffee and sandwiches. Weaver is on her heels. Mr. Morrison says to tell you he canceled the campfire and sing-along tonight, and he wants sandwiches for the searchers when they come in off the lake. A few months back, Weaver did something. Something he says he did for me, but I say he did to me. He took my composition book, and he gave it to our teacher, Miss Wilcox. She read my stories and told me I had a gift. A true gift, Maddie. A rare one. And ever since, because of the two of them, Weaver and Miss Wilcox both, I am wanting things I have no business wanting, and what they call a gift seems to me more like a burden. Somniferous In the pantheon of great writers, of profound voices, Milton stands second only to Shakespeare, Miss Wilcox said, her boot heels making pock-pock noises on the wood floor as she crossed and recrossed the schoolroom on that warm April day three months ago. She was nothing like our old teacher, Miss Parrish. Miss Wilcox was from New York City. She had curly auburn hair and green eyes, and she wore the most beautiful clothes, tailored waists and cutaway jackets edged with silk braid. She always looked so odd in our plain schoolroom, with its rusty stove, plank walls, and yellowed map of the world. Like some precious jewel put in a battered old gift box. Somniferous was my word of the day. It means sleep-inducing, and it was a good one to describe Paradise Lost, that dull and endless poem. Milton meant to give us a glimpse of hell, Miss Wilcox said, and he succeeded. Hell was the realization that you are only on line 325 of book one and there are 11 more books to go. What on earth did Miss Wilcox see in him? His Satan scared no one and seemed more like the Prince of Fusspots than the Prince of Hell, with all his ranting and carping and endless pontificating. Fessily, Valdarno, Valambrosa, where in blazes are those places, I wondered. Why couldn't Satan have decided to visit the North Woods? Old Forge, maybe, or, or even Eagle Bay. 
Why didn't he talk like real people did, with a cripes or a jeezum thrown in now and again? Why was it always other places and other lives that mattered? After torturing us with a few more pages, Miss Wilcox finally finished the lesson and dismissed the class. Maddie, stay after, will you? She opened her desk, took out an envelope, and held it out to me. As soon as I saw what it was, my mouth went dry as salt. Here, Maddie, take it. Well, open it, for God's sake! There was a single sheet of paper inside clipped to my battered old composition book. Dear Miss Goki, it read, It is with great pleasure that I write to inform you of your acceptance to Barnard College. Damn it, Maddie, what does it say? I looked at my teacher, barely able to breathe, much less speak. It says, they want me, I thought. Barnard College wants me, Maddie Goki from the Uncas Road in Eagle Bay. It says that the dean herself likes my stories. I can be something if I choose, something more than a know-nothing farm girl. I finally said, I'm accepted, and I got a scholarship, a full scholarship. I knew you'd do it, Maddie. <laughs> Can't you imagine, she asked, laughing. You're going to be a college student. You, this fall, in New York City, no less. As soon as she said it, as soon as she talked about my dream like that and brought it out in the light and made it real, I saw only the impossibility of it all. I had a pa who would never let me go. I had no money and no prospect of getting any. My feelings must have been on my face because Miss Wilcox's smile suddenly faded. My sister Annabelle will give you room and board in exchange for a bit of housework. For book money, you could always get a job. Typing, perhaps. Girls who know what they're doing, I thought. Not girls in old washed dresses and cracked shoes. What about your father? Can he help you at all? No, ma'am. I'll talk to him, Maddie. I'll tell him if you want me to. I laughed at that. A flat, joyless laugh. <laughs> no, ma'am. I don't. Unman. The Fulton Chain Floating Library is only a tiny room below decks in Charlie Eckler's pickle boat. He had a new book in by a Mrs. Wharton, The House of Mirth. Thank you, Mr. Eckler. Did you read it? Yep. What's it about? Can't hardly say. Don't know why it's called House of Mirth. It ain't funny in the least. The boat is also a floating grocery store and is the only store floating or not for miles. When I got back on deck, I saw that Royal Loomis had come on board. He was paying for two cinnamon sticks, ten pounds of flour, and a bag of nails. Hey, Royal, I said. Hey. I handed Mr. Eckler fifty cents of my father's money for the cornmeal. You like a ride, Matt? Who? Me? Ain't nobody else here named Matt. I climbed up on the hard wooden seat of the buckboard and settled myself next to Royal. The horses, a pair of bays, were new. Pa said Mr. Loomis had bought them cheap from a man who'd lost his farm to the bank. They wickered and blew, but Royal kept them calm. You still playing that game? What game? You know, fooling with words and such. It's not fooling. You really look up a new word every day? Yes. What was it today? Unman. What does it mean? To break down the manly spirit to deprive of courage or fortitude. <laughs> you sure are a notional girl. He nodded at the book in my lap. What you got there? A novel, The House of Mirth. Words and stories. Waste of time if you ask me. I didn't ask you. A man's got to know how to read and write, of course, to get along in the world and all. But beyond that, words are just words. They're not very exciting. Not like fishing or hunting. How would you know, Royal? You don't read. Nothing's more exciting than a book. 
That's so. Yes, that's so, I said, finishing it. Or so I thought. Huh, he said. And then he snapped the reins, hard, and barked, Giddy up, loudly. The buckboard shuddered, then picked up speed. Are we in a hurry, Royal? His face was serious, but his eyes sparked mischief. This is the first time I've had them out. Sure like to see what they're made of, though. Hee-yaw! The horses lurched forward in their harnesses. Their hooves pounded against the hard pan. Mrs. Wharton's novel thudded to the floor. Royal, stop! I shouted, clutching the dash. The buckboard was bouncing and banging all over the rutted road so hard I was sure one of us would fly out of it. But Royal didn't stop. Instead, he stood up on the seat, cracked the reins, and spurred the team on. Slow down right now, I screamed. But he couldn't hear me. He was too busy whooping and laughing. The wind tore my hair free of its knot and made my eyes tear. After what seemed like forever, Royal finally slowed the team to a trot and then to a walk. Hoo-wee, he said to me. Thought we was in the ditch for a second there. And then he touched me. He leaned across the seat and pressed his hand to my heart, palm flat against my ribs, thumb and fingers jammed up under my breast. In the split second before I slapped it away, I felt my heart beat hard against it. Ticker's pounding fit to burst, he said. Like to see a book do that. I wanted to answer Royal back with something clever and cutting, but every gulp of air brought the smell of him with it, warm skin and tilled earth. I closed my eyes, but only saw him standing on the buckboard seat, tall and strong, heedless, fearless, perfect and beautiful. Unman, my word of the day. Can a girl be unmanned, I wondered, by a boy? Can she be unbrained? June 20th, 1906, Chester. Please write often, dear, and tell me you will come before Papa makes me tell the whole affair, or they will find it out for themselves. I lie down on one side of the old iron bed I share with Ada. It is beastly hot up here in the Glenmore's attic. Ada is kneeling, praying. I would like to pray, but I can't. The words won't come. Cook comes in. Now listen, girls, I want you to go right to sleep tonight and remember that poor thing downstairs in your prayers. I wonder how I'm supposed to remember the dead girl downstairs and sleep well. I turn on my side and slide one hand under my pillow. My fingers touch the letters. Ada, when you make someone a promise, do you always have to keep it? Mama says you do. Even if the person you promised to dies? Especially then. You can't break a promise to anyone who's dead. They'll come back and haunt you if you do. Why are you asking? No reason, I say. Vicky Simon was reading A Gathering Light by Jennifer Donnelly. It was abridged by Penny Lester and produced by Liz Allard. Story of young Matty with a real-life murder case from 1906. Matty has been given a bundle of letters belonging to Grace Brown to burn. But when Grace is found drowned the next day in Big Moose Lake, the letters remain undestroyed and a tantalising story begins to emerge. The reader is Vicky Simon. South Otselic, June 20th, 1906. My dear Chester. Dead. That's what'll be if Cook catches me, in Ada's threadbare robe, my hair loose, walking down the main staircase as if I were a paying guest. I am writing to tell you that I am coming back to Cortland. I simply can't stay here any longer. Mama worries and wonders why I cry so much. 
Please, come and take me away to some place, dear. I pass the hallway to the parlor and get a fright when I see light spilling out of the room onto the hall carpet. But then I remember. That's where Grace Brown is laid out. Chester, I am so frightened, dear. You have said you would come, and sometimes I just know you will. But then I think about other things, and I'm just as certain you won't come. I run the rest of the way to the door to the cellar in the furnace, twist the knob, and it's locked. Now what? Grace Brown is gone and her letters should be too. I leave the kitchen and head back to the attic. I tell my feet to keep going, but they have their own ideas. They take me to the parlor instead. I try to have it out with Grace as I sit with her. I tell her that she was wrong to have given me her letters. I tell her it is entirely possible that Carl Graham really is Carl Graham, and that Chester Gillette is someone else entirely, and the fact that Grace called Carl Chester and wrote, Chester, I have done nothing but cry, and Chester, do you miss me, while certainly a big fat coincidence, proves nothing. I tell her I am not going to read any more of her letters, and if it was her intention all along to get me to, then she is very selfish and underhanded. Was. She was very selfish and underhanded. The bruises on Grace Brown's lips look darker in the lamplight, and the cut on her forehead looks meaner. Voices drift past the window. Men's voices. I freeze. I hear the front door open. Maddie Goki said she'd heard the girl call him Gillette. Chester Gillette. There's Gillette's down Cortland Way. Well-heeled bunch. That's Mr. Sperry, the Glenmore's owner. He closed the door behind him. South Ott Selleck, where the girl's from? That's near Cortland, isn't it? That's Mr. Morrison, the hotel manager. It's a strange thing. You'd think one would be near the other. What would, the towns? The bodies in the water. You'd have thought we'd find one near the other. Mr. Morrison busies himself at the reception desk. Look at this. A wire from Albany. From the chief of police about Carl Graham. What's it say? It says, there's no such person by that name living in the city. The two men look at each other and go out to the porch. I run back to the attic and shove Grace Brown's letters back under my mattress and climb into bed and squeeze my eyes shut and press my hands over my ears and pray and pray and pray for sleep to come. Auger. It was a warm and glorious Saturday afternoon. Not quite two months ago, though it seems much longer. A buckboard pulled up at the bottom of the Uncas Road, one drawn by two bay horses. Hey, Royal, what brings you this way? Want to go to Higby's? Man who works at the boathouse is a friend. They're getting the boats ready for the season. He'll let us take a skiff for free. I sat facing him and let the perfection of a spring day in the North Woods take my breath away. When Royal got tired of rowing, we drifted a while under some shaggy hemlocks leaning out from the shore. He didn't talk much, but he did point out a family of mallards, a pair of mergansers, and a blue heron. I watched him as he watched the heron take flight, his eyes never leaving it, and wondered if maybe I'd been wrong about him. I'd always thought him inarticulate, but maybe he had a different sort of eloquence. Maybe he appreciated things other than words. The dark beauty of the lake, for example, or the awesome majesty of the forest. Maybe his quietness masked a great and boiling soul. It was a quaint notion, and one he quickly dispelled. Skunk ate all my chicks last night. Guts and feathers all over the yard. They were mine, those chicks. Plan to raise them and sell them come fall. I'm sorry to hear that, Royal. His face was in profile, but then he turned and smiled at me, and my breath caught, and I wondered if this was how it felt to be pretty. When he finished talking about chickens, I talked about my exams and the grades I'd gotten, but I could tell he was bored. So then I talked about Barnard, 
and how even though I couldn't get the money to go, I still wished I could. Why would you want to go all the way to New York City just to read books? So maybe I can learn how to write them someday, Royal. Why can't you read your books right here? He moved forward in the boat until his knees touched mine. Why do you always want to read about other people's lives, Matt? Ain't your own good enough for you? I didn't need to reply to that, because he kissed me and I kissed him back, and that was reply enough. Plain old kisses at first, and then a real deep one. And then he put his arms around me and held me to him, and it felt so good. No one had so much as hugged me since my mama died. My word of the day, auger, means to foretell things from omens. His lips were sweeter than anything I'd ever tasted, and his hands felt like comfort and danger all mixed up. I knew I should stop them, stop him, find my voice and tell him no. But then the warmth of him under my own hands, and the smell of him all soap and sweat, and the taste of him overwhelmed me. And so I closed my eyes, and all I knew was his nearness. And all I wanted was my own story and no one else's. And so I said nothing. Nothing at all. Glean. Lou, stop! Then comes Junior and a baby carriage. I said stop. Sucking his thumb, wetting his pants, doing the hula hula dance. Lou! You're blushing, Matt. You're sweet on Royal Lou, Miss. I know you are. I tried hard to be good-natured about my sister's teasing, but I couldn't. Anyone with eyes could see that Royal was handsome, and I was plain. Lou started singing her stupid song again, but then something appeared up ahead of us on the road that interested her far more than tormenting me did. An automobile. It was Miss Wilcox. She tossed her cigarette she'd been smoking and removed her goggles. Hello, Maddie, Lou. Why don't you two hop in? We'll go back to my house and have some lunch. The house was cool and dark inside and smelled like oil soap. There were carpets everywhere and velvet curtains thick and heavy enough to shut out the whole world. Shall we take our lunch into the library? What I saw next stopped me dead in my tracks. Books. Not just one or two dozen, but hundreds of them. In crates, in piles on the floor, in bookcases that stretch from floor to ceiling and line the entire room. There were dozens of names I didn't know. Elliot, Zola, Whitman, Wild, Yates, Sand, Dickinson. And all those were just in one stack. There were lives in those books and deaths. I reached out and touched the cover of one called The Earth. I could almost hear the characters inside, murmuring and jostling, impatient for me to open the cover and let them out. You can borrow anything you like, Maddie, I heard Miss Wilcox say. Maddie? There was a writing table under the window, with pens and pencils and a stack of good paper. A few more sheets covered with handwriting all in lines like a poem were spread haphazardly across the tabletop. Miss Wilcox came over and shuffled them into a pile. I'm sorry, I said, suddenly remembering myself. I didn't mean to pry. I sat down and took a sandwich, and to make conversation, Miss Wilcox said she saw me riding the other day with a tall and handsome boy. That's Royal Loomis. Maddie's sweet on him, Lou said. No, I'm not. Miss Wilcox raised an eyebrow. I'm not. I don't like any of the boys around here. Why not? Miss Wilcox asked. I suppose it's hard to like anyone real after Captain Wentworth and Colonel Brandon, I said, trying my best to sound worldly wise. Jane Austen ruins you for farm boys and loggers. Miss Wilcox laughed. <laughs> Jane Austen ruins you for everything else, too. Do you like her books? I like them some. Just some? Well, ma'am, I feel, well, 
Hornswoggled sometimes. By Jane Austen and Louisa May Alcott. Why do writers make things sugary when life isn't that way? Why don't they tell the truth? Why don't they tell how it is for a girl when her baby won't come out? Or that cancer has a smell to it? All those books, Miss Wilcox, I said, pointing to a pile of them, and I'll bet not one of them will tell you what cancer smells like. I can, though. It stinks. Like, like meat gone bad and dirty clothes and bog water all mixed together. Why doesn't anyone tell you that? Cripes, Maddie, Lou said quietly. You wouldn't to talk like that. I'm sorry, Miss Wilcox, I said, looking at the floor. I don't mean to be coarse. I just... I don't know why I should care what happens to people in a drawing room in London or Paris or, or anywhere else where no one in those places cares what happens to people in Eagle Bay. Make them care, Maddie, Miss Wilcox said softly. And don't you ever be sorry. She glanced at Lou and then asked me, Has there been any progress with your pa? No, ma'am. And there's not likely to be. Would you consider working for me, then? I need help with my library, as you can see. I'll pay you. A dollar each time. It was only the first week of May. If I worked for Miss Wilcox one day a week throughout the summer, I'd have sixteen dollars or so by the time September came. Enough for a train ticket and then some. I wanted to say yes so badly, but... Then I heard Royal asking me why I was always reading about other people's lives and felt his lips on mine. I heard Pa saying, I didn't need to go to Miss Wilcox's to find work. There was plenty for me at my own house. And I heard my mama asking me to make a promise just before she died to stay and take care of her babies. I can't, Miss Wilcox, I said. I can't get away. I've got the chickens to do, the coop needs whitewashing, and Pa said he wants it done by Sunday. I'll do it, Matt, Lou said. Me and Abby and Beth. Pa won't know. He'll be out plowing. He won't raise Cain long as the work gets done. I looked at my sister, who wasn't supposed to be listening. I saw the crumbs around her mouth, the lank hair hanging in her face. I saw her blue eyes big and hopeful, and I loved her so much I had to look away. Tomorrow, Matty receives a proposal when Vicky Simon continues reading A Gathering Light by Jennifer Donnelly. The book's abridged by Penny Lester, and the producer is Liz Allard. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Jake Yap hosts Wednesday's Comedy Club in 15 minutes here on 4 Extra. To take us there, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, part of the Lovecraft Investigations by Julian Simpson, in which our two podcasters, Matthew Haywood and Kennedy Fisher, are trying to solve one heck of a mystery. And this time, Alice has made a disturbing discovery. Don't you think it's weird? It's very weird. Well, then shouldn't we... No. Nope. But if... No. I don't understand. No one has died in this town since 1897? Yes, that is very weird. It's also incredibly unlikely. And there's probably a perfectly rational explanation to do with record keeping or whatever. Okay, well, that's If you easy. want to check into that, be my guest. I am here for one thing and one thing only. To dig into my family's history in this town. Maybe there is weird shit happening in Innsmouth. But if there's any way for that weird shit not to involve me for once, that would be great. Okay. I understand. I'm going to go find this Zadok Allen character and I'm going to find out if his little historical society has any information on the Fishers. I've got to be laser focused with this, Alice, you understand? Otherwise, I'm going to spiral off into all kinds of other things and... Honestly, right now, I feel like I've had about as much as I can take. I just want to go home. That's fair enough. I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to drag you into anything. I know you didn't. It's fine. 
Listen, you do whatever you need to do, and when I'm done here, I don't even know where you're staying. You're not at the Gilman, are you? No, I found the only rental in town, which turned out to be this really cute cottage overlooking the ocean. If you want, I could make dinner later. I'm not a chef or anything, but I have some steaks and Who's? I brought a couple bottles of wine. Okay, sold. Let's do that. I'll go and see Zadok and then I'll give you a call. The man who emerged from the basement of the building was in his late 60s or early 70s, tall and thin with thick silver hair that sat on his collar. Ah, uh, Monsieur Lévesque? He wore a dark suit and a striped tie that might have signalled membership of some kind of club. Nous recherchons des informations sur un homme qui a visité cette archive. Dr. Allen. Your uh, French is very good. Oh. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> I explained who we were and why we were there, and Monsieur Levesque led us down two flights of steps and into... Wow. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, everyone first time. Oh, wow. <laughs> the Levesque Institute of Paranormal and Parapsychological Research is situated in the basement of the building, and it takes up an area the size of the whole block. It uh, used to be a uh, storage for goods moving by river. So... The walls are made of rough stone bricks and the ceiling is vaulted. It feels like every inch of the space is taken up with reading material. There are rows and rows of bookcases and old wooden filing cabinets. And there are tables here and there piled high with papers and journals. Yeah, it seems to be a mess, but I know where everything is. The system is my memory, so I suppose this is why I work alone. <laughs> I asked Lisa's teacher, Miss Wilcox, astonish Matty and provide food for thought. Vicky Simon reads the penultimate instalment of A Gathering Light. South Otselic, June 23rd, 1906. My dear Chester, I am just wild because I don't get a letter from you. Maddie, shut the light. What are you doing up? A voice hisses in the darkness of the attic. Nothing, Ada, I say, quickly tucking Grace Brown's letter back in its envelope. Just reading. I wait for a bit, until I hear no bed springs creaking, and then quietly... Carefully, I unfold the letter again. If you wrote me Tuesday night and posted it Wednesday morning, there isn't any reason why I shouldn't get it. Are you sure you addressed the letter right? I have been home nearly a week and have not had one line from you. Franny says someone struck her, Ada whispers, making me jump. She went to look at her after supper. She said there was a huge, bloody cut on her face. You saw her, Matt. What'd she look like? Like someone who drowned. Cook says the undersheriff's on his way, and the coroner, and the man from the Utica paper. Go to sleep, Ada. We'll be busier than ever tomorrow. Ada rolls over and I open another letter. It has no greeting. I understand how you feel about the affair. You think if it wasn't for me... You could do as you liked all summer and not be obliged to give up your position there. I don't suppose you've ever considered how it puts me out of all the good times for the summer and how I had to give up my position there. Was Grace sick, I wonder? Is that why she had to give up her position? Did they work at the same place? Maybe at that place Mr. Sperry was talking about, the skirt factory that the well-heeled Cortland Gillettes owned. But why would they both have to give up their positions? It didn't make any sense. Chester, I don't suppose you will ever know how I regret being all this trouble to you. I know you hate me and I can't blame you one bit. My whole life is ruined, and in a measure yours is too. Of course, it's worse for me than for you. But the world and you too may think that I am the one to blame, but somehow I can't just simply can't think I am, Chester. I said no so many times, dear. Of course, the world will not know that, but it's true all the same. 
my eyes latch on to one line again. I have said no so many times, dear. And then I gasp out loud, because I have said no a few times myself, dear, and I finally understand why Grace was so upset. She was carrying a baby. Chester Gillette's baby. That's why she had to give up her position and go home. That's why she was so desperate for him to come and take her away. Before her belly got big and the whole world found out. And then I think of something else. That I am the only person, the only person in the entire world who knows this. Break a promise to the dead and they'll haunt you, Ada says. Keep the promise, and they'll haunt you just the same. Malediction It was two months ago, Saturday, my favorite day of the week, for on Saturdays I got to work in Miss Wilcox's library. I had just trotted up the back steps to her house and was standing on the porch, about to knock on her door, when I heard voices inside. Loud, angry voices. There is to be no more scribbling, Emily. No more foolishness. You're to come home and take up your duties and responsibilities. There was a terrible crash and the sound of glass breaking, and then I heard Miss Wilcox shout, Get out! Get out! The door was wrenched open and a man stormed by me. I think he would have knocked me right on my backside if I hadn't stepped out of his way. Miss Wilcox, are you all right? She nodded, but her eyes were red, and she was trembling. Just leave the mess, Maddie. I'll see to it. Help yourself to whatever's in the kitchen. Your money's on the table. I heard her speaking, but my eyes were on the broken glass and the scattered pages. The writing table had been upended. The beautiful red apple paperweight had been smashed to bits. He'd done this. Malediction was my word of the day. It means bad speaking. Like a curse. Will that man be back? I ask. Not today. I think you should call for the sheriff, Miss Wilcox. Miss Wilcox smiled sourly at that and said, He wouldn't come. It's not illegal, not yet at least, for a man to destroy his wife's home. I didn't say anything, but my eyes must have been as big and as round as two fried eggs. Yes, Maddie, that was my husband, Theodore Baxter. Baxter? Baxter? Then you're not... What, then that... That makes you... Emily Baxter, poet. I'd read articles about Emily Baxter in Aunt Josie's cast-off newspapers. They'd said she was an affront to common decency and a blight on American womanhood. Her volume of poetry had been banned by the Catholic Church and publicly burned in Boston. I thought there would be curse words in it for sure, or dirty pictures or something just god-awfully terrible. But there weren't. Only poems. One was about a young woman who gets an apartment in the city by herself and eats her first supper in it all alone. But it wasn't sad. Not one bit. And one was about God being a woman instead of a man. That must have been the one that made the Pope boiling mad. Jeez, um, what if God was a woman? Emily Baxter's poems made me think of so many questions and possibilities. Reading one was like pulling a stump. You got hold of a root and tugged, hoping it would come right up. But sometimes it went so deep and so far, you were halfway to the Loomis farm and still pulling. Abscission According to the article I'd read in Peterson's magazine, if you wish to attract a man, you need to use the eloquent, unspoken language of the female body to let him know that he is the very center of your universe, the primary reason for your existence. I thought it meant I should bat my lashes, but when I tried it, Royal looked at me with a puzzled expression and asked if I'd gotten some grit in my eye. We were halfway up the Loomis's drive. Our cow, Daisy, had gone and smashed through their fence. 
Pa was furious. Mrs. Loomis was, too. I pretended to be, but really, I was glad, for it meant I got to see Royal without looking like I wanted to. He'd been in the barnyard, just as I'd hoped. He'd helped me get Daisy out of the pond, and now he was walking me home. Look at that stretch of land right there, Matt, he said, sweeping his hand in front of him. Make good growing land. I'd farm it for corn in a second. The stretch of land he was talking about included a bit of my father's, as well as Loomis' land. He shrugged. A man can dream, can he? And before I could say anything in reply, he asked me if I'd like to go riding with him to Inlet and back that very night. I said I would. And as soon as I told him yes, he let go of Daisy's rope, pulled me in under some maple trees, and kissed me. His heart was beating slow and steady, unlike my own, which was thumping like a thresher. I guessed it must be different for a boy than it was for a girl. I felt his hands circling my waist, and then one slipped lower, to a place Mama told me no one should ever touch, only a husband. Royal, no! He pulled away from me, and his face darkened, and I felt I'd done something wrong. My word of the day was abscission. It means a sudden termination. I felt its meaning as I looked at Royal's face all clouded. He looked at the ground, then back at me. I ain't playing mad if that's what you think. I seen a ring in Tuttle's. I blinked for a reply because I didn't understand what he meant. He sighed and shook his head. If I was to buy it, would you want it? Good Lord, that kind of ring. I thought he meant a ring for a harness, but he meant a real ring. Oh, yes, yes, I would, I whispered. And then I threw my arms around his neck and kissed him and nearly sobbed with relief when I felt him kiss me back. I didn't think what it meant saying yes. All I wanted was royal right then, and I didn't think how saying yes to him would mean saying no to all the other things I wanted. It was only much later, when I was upstairs in bed remembering every one of his kisses, that I wondered if he was supposed to have said he loved me when he told me about the ring. Or if maybe that came later. Things are never what they seem. I'd seen my Miss Wilcox as a spinster teacher. She wasn't. She was a lady poet who'd run away from her husband. I'd seen Royal Loomis as too fine to ever notice the likes of me, but now we were driving together every night. I'd seen my chances of working at one of the hotels as zero, but there I was, just two weeks before decoration day and the official start of the summer season, sitting next to my father in the buckboard on the way to the Glenmore. My mama's old carpet bag was on the floor between us, heavy as a hod of bricks. It was packed with my dictionary, a few other books from Miss Wilcox, my night clothes, and two of mama's better skirts that Abby had taken in for me. Two days before, I'd gone into the barn to fetch Pleasant out and found him stiff and cold in his stall. Pa said it was old age. He couldn't be without a mule, but a good one cost about twenty dollars, and he didn't have it. That's when he decided I would go to the Glenmore. He didn't like the idea any more in May than he had in March, but he had no choice. I should have been excited. I wanted to go to the Glenmore for months, but it felt... bittersweet. I wasn't working to get myself to Barnard College. I was working because Pa needed a new mule. I was sorry I couldn't work for Miss Wilcox anymore. A loon is calling from the lake. The tourists say it's a beautiful sound. I think it's the loneliest sound I know. I am still reading. Dear Chester, I will tell you I am going to try and do a whole lot better, dear. I will try not to worry so much. I am awfully pleased you had such a jolly time at the lake, dear, and I wish I had been there, too. I am very fond of water, although I can't swim. I hope you will have an awfully nice time on the 4th of July. I don't care where you go or who you go with if only you come for the 7th. 
You are so fond of boating in the water. It is a long letter and there are many more lines to read, but my eyes keep straying back to one line. I am very fond of water, although I can't swim. A chill grips me. I can't read anymore. I try to stuff the letter back into its envelope, but my hands are shaking so hard it takes me three tries. He knew she couldn't swim. He knew it. And tomorrow, Vicky Simon reads the final instalment of A Gathering Light by Jennifer Donnelly. It was abridged in five parts by Penny Lester. The producer was Elizabeth Allard. ...on just one favourite food, pizza. Do you know, I'm not sure about it, but it will make an interesting listen. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. And now we conclude Jennifer Donnelly's 2003 award-winning novel A Gathering Light, which marries the fictional story of young Matty with a real-life murder case of 1906. Today, will she stay or will she go? Matty reads Grace's last letter and receives some news from Miss Wilcox. <laughs> The sky outside my window is still dark, but I can hear the rustlings of night creatures seeking their beds and the first questing chirrups of the birds. I have read all of Grace's letters now, all but the last one. South Otselic, July 5th, 1906. My dear Chester, how I wish this was Monday. I will get there about 10 o'clock, if you take the 9.45 train from the Lehigh, you will get there about 11. I have been bidding goodbye to some places today. There are so many nooks, dear, and all of them so dear to me. First I said goodbye to the spring house with its great masses of green moss, then the apple tree where we had our playhouse. I know I shall never see any of them again. Sometimes I think if I could tell Mama, but I can't. I couldn't break her heart like that. If I come back dead, perhaps if she does know, she won't be angry with me. I miss you, and I want to see you, but I wish I could die. Please come, and don't let me wait there. She knew. Somehow, Grace Brown knew that she wasn't ever coming back. She hoped that Chester would take her away and do the right thing by her, but deep down inside, a part of her knew. It's why she wrote about never seeing the things and places and people she loved again, and why she imagined coming back dead, and why she wanted her letters burned. I slide the letter back into its envelope. I gather all the letters together, slip the ribbon around them, and carefully retie it. I can hear Grace's voice. I can hear the grief and desperation and sorrow, not in my ears, in my heart. Voice, according to Miss Wilcox, is not just the sound that comes from your throat, but the feeling that comes from your words. Just look where your voice got you, Miss Wilcox, and look where Grace Brown's got hers. Serenity. It was three o'clock on an early summer afternoon, not quite one month ago. Maddie, you get the package that came for you? Mrs. Morrison was standing behind the front desk sorting through the mail. A package from the teacher. There were three books. Sister Carrie by Theodore Dreiser, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, and Threnody, a volume of poetry by Emily Baxter. Miss Wilcox had written another book, even though her husband told her not to. Next, I opened the envelope and caught my breath as a five-dollar bill fluttered out. There was a letter, too. Dear Maddie, 
I thought you might like these books. I hope, particularly, that you enjoy the volume of poetry, as I wish to leave you something by which to remember me. I am departing Eagle Bay tomorrow. I won't be teaching next year. I am including Annabelle's, my sister's, address in this note. I've told her all about you, and she's very eager to have you as a boarder. The enclosed will help get you to her house. I ran to the kitchen. I've got to go to Inlet. I've got to go. Weaver hitched up Demon, and we drove hell for leather all the way down Big Moose Road. When we arrived, I ran up the back steps and banged on the door. Maddie, is that you? Miss Wilcox said, opening the door. Why are you leaving, Miss Wilcox? My husband is furious about the new book and is on his way, Maddie. If I'm still here when he arrives, the next stop for me is a doctor's office. And then a sanatorium and so many drugs pushed down my throat I won't be able to remember my own name, much less write. He can't do that. Oh, he can. He's a powerful man. Where will you go? I'm going to hock my jewelry and go to Paris. And I'm going to do my best to get a divorce. A few more volumes of poetry should do the trick. Miss Wilcox smiled as she said that, but I saw the cigarette tremble between her fingers. Maybe you can visit me in Paris someday. Or maybe, if it all goes well, I can come home sooner rather than later. And then we can have lunch on the Barnard campus. I don't think so, Miss Wilcox, I said, my eyes on the floor. But why not? I'm not going to Barnard. I'm staying here. My God, Maddie, why? Royal Loomis has asked me to marry him, and I told him yes. Miss Wilcox looked like someone had drained all the sap from her. She looked small to me, small and fragile and defenseless. She had not looked that way when I'd arrived. Ideal. July 5th was my 17th birthday, and Royal was standing in the doorway of the Glenmore kitchen, looking as awkward as a hog on stilts. Ideal was my word of the day, a standard of perfection, or something existing only in the imagination was its meaning. I, uh, I brought you this. He held up a package. For you, it's a book. Is it really? I whispered. He shrugged, pleased by my reaction but trying not to show it. I know you like books. My heart lifted. It soared. Royal did care enough to look down inside of me. To think that Royal had gone to a store and picked this out. Just for me. My fingers trembled as I undid the string. What had he chosen for me? An Austin or a Bronte? Maybe a Zola or a Hardy? I opened the paper and saw that it was a farmer. Fanny Farmer. A cookbook. Thought you might be needing that soon. I could see in his eyes he wanted me to like it. I could see that he'd tried and it only made it worse. Thank you, Royal, I said, smiling so hard my face hurt. Thank you so very much. I sit perfectly still for a long time, just holding the letters and looking out the window. In another hour or so, the sun will rise and Cook will barge in and wake us. We'll go downstairs and begin readying the dining room for breakfast. My pa will arrive with his milk and butter, and then Royal with his eggs and berries. The guests will come down for breakfast. And then the men from Herkimer, the sheriff and the coroner will arrive. Cook will badger and yell, and somehow in all the commotion, I will try again to get down the cellar stairs to the furnace. I look down at the bundle in my hands. If I burn these letters, who will hear Grace Brown's voice? Who will read her story? Quietly, I get out of bed, dress, 
put up my hair and gather my belongings. I'm not sure of the time, but I would guess about five o'clock. When I'm ready, I count out my savings. I leave the attic, careful to make no noise, and walk down the main stairs. I am in Mr. Morrison's office, my mama's old carpet bag in my hand, just as the sky is starting to lighten. I place Grace's letters on his desk, then write him a note on Glenmore Stationery, explaining how I got them. I write two more notes. The first is to my father. It has two dollars in it, the balance of what he owes on the new mule, and a promise that I will write. The second has a ring in it, a small, dull ring with an opal and two garnets. It is addressed to Royal Loomis and says, to see if Tuttles will take it back, and that I'm sorry. It is just past ten o'clock. I am standing, frightened, but resolved, on a train platform in Old Forge. Is there a word for that? Feeling scared of what's to come, but eager for it too? Terrisipation? Joy Bodinus. Fieger? If there is, I mean to find it. My carpet bag weighs heavy in my hand. I have most everything I own inside it. I also have my train ticket in there, an address for Miss Annabel Wilcox of New York City, and two dollars and twenty-five cents. It's all I have left from the money I saved. I will have to find a job right away. A northbound train pulls in. An express. A handful of tourists and some workmen get off, followed by two men wearing jackets and ties. That's him, Austin Clock. He's the undersheriff, a man standing next to me says to his companion. Told you this was more than some run-of-the-mill drowning. They pull out notepads. Reporters, I imagine. The undersheriff holds his hands up as they approach him. Gentlemen, I know as much about it as you do. A girl drowned at the Glenmore, her body's been recovered, her companion's has not. Soon you'll know more, I think. A lot more. Soon you'll know that the girl was called Grace, and that she spent her last weeks on this earth pregnant and afraid, begging the man who'd made her so to come and take her away. But he'd had other ideas. I close my eyes, and I can see Chester Gillette. He's signing the guest book at the Glenmore as Carl Graham. I see him row all the way out to South Bay. He waits until he's sure there's no one else around, and then he hits Grace. He tips the boat and swims to shore. Grace can't swim. He knows that because she told him. She'd drown even if she wasn't unconscious, but it's quieter this way. She can't scream for help. Later, when the boat is recovered, it will look to the searchers like Grace Brown and her companion both drowned. No one will ever find out that Grace was pregnant or that Chester Gillette was the father of her child. Her death will be Carl Graham's fault, and Chester will be free to return to Cortland and have a good and dandy time. I see Chester now, today. Smiling, he's sure as hell not dead. Not him. I'd bet my last dollar on that. I see Grace Brown, too. Stiff and cold in a room in the Glenmore, with a tiny life that will never be inside her. And then I hear a whistle, shrill and piercing. I open my eyes and see the tracks and the southbound train coming down them. People swirl around me, and still I cannot move. I think of my family. I can see Pa sitting by the fire, and Royal, plowing his father's fields, gazing across them to my father's land with the look of love and longing he'd never shown me. The engine exhales. The wheels strain against the tracks. Wait! I cry, stumbling forward. The conductor reaches down for me. I look around myself wildly, my heart bursting with grief and fear and joy. I am leaving, but I will take this place and its stories with me wherever I go.
I reach for his hand and clasp it. He hoists me onto the 1015 southbound, to Utica and Herkimer and all points south, to Amsterdam and Albany and beyond, to New York City, to my future, my life. Vicky Simon was reading A Gathering Light by Jennifer Donnelly. It was abridged by Penny Lester and produced by Liz Allard. And since that was the last part of A Gathering Light, next week at this time we've five short stories by the crime author Ruth Rendell. The first on Monday tells of a retired businessman who, on returning from abroad, decides to find his ex-wife who left him for another man many years before. That's A Dark Blue Perfume on Monday, with further stories all at 